Hello and good afternoon. This is Justice for All. I'm your host, George Yates, and uh, it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and it must be time for uh, Justice for All, 1650 AM. Uh, I have a wonderful guest today. He's a super lawyer from Los Angeles, a uh, trial lawyer uh, specializing in criminal defense, and he's the go-to guy in Los Angeles, or certainly one of the go-to guys in Los Angeles when you... Uh, You need some uh, help in battling the government. Uh, His name is David Diamond, and uh, he's with me today. How are you doing, David? I'm doing well, very well. Thank you, George, for having me on today. Well, look, I'm looking forward to the next hour here with uh, Mr. Diamond. Uh, uh, He's a a graduate of the Southwestern uh, uh, School of of Law in, uh, I guess that's in Los Angeles, California, right? In the heart of downtown Los Angeles. Tell me uh, how you become a uh, the go-to super lawyer uh, that you've been described, uh, as, as I understand it. Uh, you've uh, been practicing criminal defense or as a specialty now for, what, 14 years now? 14 years. I think uh, the first thing you really need to do is distinguish yourself as somebody in the community that will really work hard on your cases, prepare for them, and be thorough uh, there's just too much competition these days, and unfortunately, there's a lot of lawyers that just want to make the quick buck, take the case, dump it, and move on. So I think one of the things we do at our firm is be very thorough in our preparation. So when it's time for presentation, uh, we are ready to go. Well, we are uh, having this conversation on a Saturday afternoon, and my understanding is as soon as you get off the uh, off the phone with me uh, to, to uh, discuss this case, you're going to be preparing for a trial so you're in the office on a saturday getting ready for an upcoming trial so it seems like uh, when you're a hard-working criminal defense lawyer you never really stop working do you 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 have to uh, you you know this uh and uh, as do other good attorneys you're dealing with the loss of liberty which is completely unlike the loss of money for example with corporate lawyers or other people uh i would assume a lot of those lawyers don't lose much sleep if they're you know their banking clients lose a few bucks in in a breach of contract case whereas our clients lose, they get locked up. So it takes its toll, and the only way to prevent that from happening is to do the work that's necessary and, and don't take any shortcuts. And even now, in the midst of uh, the start of college football season, the priority still got to be preparing for trial. You know, and, and I think that that's one reason I, I like having this show, and I think it's important that people in the general public uh, just riding along in their cars and listening to a, a talk radio show understand, uh, you know, just what lawyers do go through. I mean, lawyers get, uh, y- you know, all the lawyer jokes that you want to hear. But, boy, I tell you what, when you're charged with a crime, you know, you, you go get the, the David Diamond when you're in Los Angeles. And, and what does that mean to be – the guy that's defending that little guy against the government. What does that mean to you? Well, it's kind of the the David and Goliath story. A lot of people see the criminal defense attorneys because um, what they see on TV, you know, the OJ trials and the the big cases, and they figure there's unlimited money, there's unlimited resources, there's nothing that can't be done. But the reality is it's not like that. For the most part, it's, it's a small... Small individual, middle class working guy, and, and without much financial resources, that needs the help of a criminal defense attorney that can't pay for all the, the luxuries that most people can. And you're going up against the government. The government has endless resources. And when I say endless resources, I really mean that. I mean, the DA's office has any expert they want, they have the use of, of technology. Uh, they have the use of, of uh, paralegals and assistants and, and really uh, whatever they need to present a case. So you, you know, you read about these cases after trial. It costs the government $3 million, $4 million to prosecute this case. Well, of course, because they, they've got it and they've spent it, and uh, it's very tough for the little guy to, to really, really level the playing field. I had a guest on my show about a month ago now, Richard Gabriel. He's a well-known uh, trial consultant there in your area in Los Angeles, and he's he was one of the trial consultants to O.J. Simpson and, uh, uh, and Casey Anthony and Phil Spector and a lot of these high-profile criminal trials. He wrote a great book called Acquittal. I don't know if you've had a chance to read it, but what's interesting about his book is what it points at what you just said, that uh, – you know, you've got somebody, uh, the, the, the rap, one of the myths, uh, as he exposed, uh, it said, it were exposed in the O.J. case was that oh, O.J. bought his freedom because he went and hired all these lawyers and spent all this money. 
But as Richard Gabriel said in his book, no matter how much money O.J. Simpson spent on his defense in that case, the government spent a hell of a lot more. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I agree. I wholeheartedly uh, agree with that assertion. It's, uh, you know, he, had, he did have the luxury to have four or five lawyers, this, this you know, this, this called Dream Team. But the government had more. You know, I, I, I actually... Uh, in law school, uh, worked for one of the prosecutors on that case and had some inside stories. And, um, you know, they remember in the courtroom there was, there was only um, uh, Marsha Clark and Chris Dart, and they'd go upstairs and they'd have 50 DAs up there working on the case. So it was absolutely true in, in terms of the firepower that, that, that they were up against. When you defend a criminal case, now you are a, uh, a solo practitioner and you have uh, occasionally have a lawyer or two assisting you uh in a case what is your secret uh to preparation uh getting ready for a trial well i think the first thing you need to do is you need to read the police report over and over and over again you need to know the facts inside and out and you need to understand that any fact that you think is relatively unimportant or irrelevant is actually probably going to be something that's that's highly crucial to the case. You need to understand that nothing's a throwaway. No witness is a throwaway. No fact is a throwaway. Everything in there is there for a reason, and you really need to master the underlying facts of the case, and you also need to, to master and prepare the witnesses in the case, particularly the law enforcement officers, which you brought the power of the government. You know, the, the other side of this is, is law enforcement. You know, jurors believe cops, judges believe cops, and we've got an uphill battle because there are a lot of them out there. Uh, not all of them, but there are a lot of them out there that embellish and inflate uh, the, the truth in the case. When, when you uh, are cross-examining a police officer that you d- believe is not telling the truth or is embellishing, how do you go about doing that without losing your credibility with the jury? Well, Again, it comes to preparing. You have to let the jury know beforehand what you're going to do, and that comes in jury selection. One of the most important things we do during during pick, you know, the selection of a jury and picking prospective jurors, we ask them. We ask them and say, "Look, you're going to be told by the judge, given a jury instruction that says the testimony of an officer is no more important or should not be given any greater weight than that of a civilian." And is that something that you can live up to? And you get some people that are honest and say, no, I, you know, if, if a police officer says something, I'm going to take that as the truth. But you watch and you prepare for them and you let them know that, hey, there might be some issues here with the credibility of a police officer. So you get those people on that are at least willing to consider uh, these things might, might not be the truth. So you've already prepared for it. And then when you put the officer on the stand, my style is not like that we see on TV where I scream and yell. I really don't believe that's the art of cross-examination. I think that's more TV drama made up. But I think that uh, you know, keeping a cool demeanor and just having a conversation with the officer during cross is when you get them to, to, to kind of mess up because they're not expecting it. They want, you know, they're trained for you to yell at them and scream at them, and then they get combative. But if you just do it in a conversational tone, then they forget some of the things they wrote in the police report. Then they forget that they left this out or, or, or you know, may have gotten another fact wrong. And I, I think that's the key to, uh, to uncovering whatever factual inaccuracies are present. And do you find that uh, I, I, that sometimes if you uh, cross-examine a police officer like that and lull him, into, I, I guess maybe a false sense of security, he'll just sometimes just go rambling on and actually give you more ammunition to use against him in cross? Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, you've done this for a long time. You understand. It's, you know, the old saying, sometimes you just have to give them enough rope and they're going to hang themselves. And, and I think that's exactly the key is sometimes you just start the dialogue and they're, they get bored or they, they're, they're waiting for it saying, why, why isn't this lawyer, uh, coming after me? And eventually, uh, it just happens because they, they start telling the story and they, and they, you know, inadvertently forget what they're talking about. Well, jury selection is, is important. I know we've had two shows now just in the last several weeks. I had a jury consultant from uh, University of Virginia uh, who's written some books on voir dire, and then I had Richard Gabriel also who's a specialist in this. What's your, what's your uh, if you will, 25 words or less uh, summary of how you go about selecting a jury? You're in California, first of all, uh, and a bit longer uh, that I know that we, when we select juries here in Virginia, 
Um, you do, do you do questionnaires? Do you do lengthy uh, voir dire? Uh, summarize your, your jury selection process. Well, a lot of it comes down to the judge and how much they'll allow, but there's always the standard set of questions where you live, if you're married, children, occupation, uh, prior jury service, and any, any uh, criminal or civil jury, jury service in the past and criminal convictions. That's kind of the bookmark uh, standard. And then after that, then the lawyers get to ask questions. So very briefly, what I try to do is two things. I try to educate the juror, jurors about the law, particularly reasonable doubt standard. And I also try to develop some sort of relationship because they have so many uh, predispositions about criminal defense attorneys. So if I get someone to laugh during jury selection, I think I've done a, a really good job and I'm, I'm ready to try the case because I think you know the, the barrier has been broken and they're willing to listen and see us all as humans doing our jobs. Do you feel like it was, as soon as you walk in the courtroom, the, the jury is over there giving your client and you the stink eye? Uh, <laughs> most of the time, absolutely, uh, without a doubt, because, you know, I've had people say, well, he must have done it if he's been arrested, right. and obviously you, you, everyone knows better than that, but, uh, yeah, that's what we get a lot of times. Now, how long does it typically take to pick a jury? Like, uh, let's say you're working on a case right now, I understand you're interviewing some witnesses later on today for a very serious case. Uh, how long does it take to pick a jury, let's say, for a typical felony case in California? Well, we've got different amount of, of, of preemptory challenges we can make, which is basically, uh, you know, challenging a juror without any explanation. We just get to say, thank you, your judge. I would like this person dismissed. I don't really want them here. And then we've got challenges for cause where we have to show some, some bias or prejudice. So on most felony cases, we're getting 20 uh, challenges uh, when we're selecting the jury. So if you can imagine we get 20 and the DA gets 20, that's 40, and if they bring in a, a, a panel of 80 to 100 people, uh, jury selection can take you know, two, three, sometimes on, on higher-length uh, cases like murder cases can take you know weeks sometimes. But I would say on average you're looking at a two- to three-day process on felony cases. Do you stereotype when you're uh, – do you look for a, ter- a certain type of juror uh, on a particular type of case, or men, women, um, you know, young, old. I know we have, uh, we've discussed in the past that, you know, that the Constitution says that you can't discriminate uh, from jurors based upon their color or their sex. But do you stereotype? I mean, do you try to generally, uh, let's say, by occupation or by age or by, um, or do you just treat everybody the same uh, when they're sitting on a jury panel when you're making your challenges? Well, I'd like to say I treat everybody the same, but I think that would be a little bit disingenuous to your listeners. I think you immediately see people, uh, and you immediately start getting your thoughts. Now, do I look for a particular juror? I don't look for one, but I do look for ones I don't want to have. I typically, uh, anyone that says they're an engineer, I don't like to have them in the process because oftentimes they're overly analytical or critical and and uh, try to take control of jury. I, I enjoy having teachers uh, because I think that they are understanding of second chances and giving people the opportunity and the, and the benefit to do better. So sometimes it goes more by profession than it does by race or gender, uh, religion, things of those nature that we, we can't select juries on, even though I think that it would be, you know, again, dishonest for any lawyer to say that they're not already stereotyping. But a lot of it comes down to, to someone's profession. And you also remember, you want people that are going to deliberate. There, there's definitely a stereotypical group that you can tell will just go with the majority. And that's the most important thing to get rid of, is any, any prospective juror that you can tell is just going to go with whatever the majority vote is and be swayed. So you want, you want to look for those independent thinking people. My guess is a lot of people that are listening to this show uh, have either served on a jury uh, or want to serve on a jury. Uh, and what do you tell them if you're a lawyer and you're talking to somebody that may serve on a jury at some point in the future? Well, what's your advice as a as a lawyer and to advise them on how to better enjoy that experience? Well, I the first thing I do, and I've got a lot of friends, family, my wife, myself. We've all been you know summoned to jury duty. It's an essential part of this justice system in our in our country. 
there are so many countries out there that do not have the jury system, and, and, and I remind them that our system is broken without your service. And it, and it stinks, and it's not fun, and you're away from the things you want to do, and you don't get to work, and some people don't get to make money. Uh, but we need this system. We need this system because it creates uh, the perception of impartiality uh, in a jury panel. So I remind them that we need you to do this, and it's difficult, but it's one of those things. And the second thing I tell them is to keep an open mind. I remind them not to prejudge the evidence, and you really have to listen to both sides. If you feel yourself making a decision, take a step back mentally and internally and just think, all right, I need to hear all the evidence in this case before I even start making a decision. Now, how did you get involved in practicing law in the first place? What is your background? Uh <laughs> Well, my parents would tell you I was an arguer from birth, and maybe that's the direction that got me going in there. But uh, I think it really happened as I was an undergraduate attending the fine University of Michigan State, and they had a program there for all students that were accused of uh, university violations, disciplinary things. They were represented by fellow students. It was called the Student Defender Program. So. I got involved with that, and I would represent my peers in, in front of hearing boards who were accused of, you know, drinking in public or throwing parties or, you know, much more egregious comment, all the way up to sexual assault and everything in between. And that's really where I got my start. I enjoyed representing the interests of those that were accused of doing something, and I felt that this was the path that I wanted to take. And uh, that was the path, path obviously, I've, I've, I've taken since then. Well, that's fascinating. So you uh, did some criminal defense, if you will, uh, advocacy, uh, before you ever went to law school. So did you know then when you started law school that that's what you wanted to do? Or had you already made up your mind to be a criminal defense lawyer before you ever started law school? It was really all I ever wanted to do. I, I, was, I was keen on leveling the play field, playing field. Even, even at those university hearings, you had, you, know, you had a panel of five people deciding if a kid was expelled or not. Four of them were professors. One was a, a token student thrown on there, and they were never really given a fair shake. So for me, the combination of, of some of the most incredible criminal law-based professors I've ever seen at Southwestern, plus my, my prior history was always leading me in the direction of uh, criminal defense. Now, I, I interned. I became a certified law clerk with the district attorney's office in law school, and that even uh pushed me further towards becoming a defense attorney. So you saw as a student what going in front of a biased tribunal was all about uh, with this, uh, you said, uh, professors on this panel. Are you saying then that it was somewhat against you from the get-go when you were trying to defend these students? I think it was. I mean, I think it was very difficult. Uh, a lot of times, you know, the kid was going to be suspended or expelled, and, and that was just the end of it. I was hoping for a little bit more impartiality. Right. And then you can combine that with my experience, you know, with the prosecutor's office. Well, tell us about uh, that. And, so and I just, you went to the prosecutor's office, and you uh, were you disillusioned then with the level of fairness on that side of the aisle? I think, and, and don't get me wrong, some of my closest friends and colleagues are prosecutors, and I think, obviously, that there is a, a tremendous need to do their job. We need to keep society safe, and we, you know, we can't have people committing crimes walking around. So I, I say it with a caveat that, that I respect and understand the prosecutor's job. What I didn't like was the mentality, the kill, kill, kill mentality. You know, I saw DAs, prosecutors, state attorneys, whatever we call them in our jurisdiction, you know, high-fiving, oh, you hear I got an extra five years tacked onto this guy's punishment. And, you know, I, it strikes me because I think there is a changing mentality. I had a, a, a gang case a few years ago where a young man, uh, mid-20s, was put away for quite some time, and I looked at the DA afterwards and congratulated her, and, you know, she, she said to me, you know what, nobody, nobody won here today. Everybody loses. And it struck me. That was one of the most compelling things I've ever had a prosecutor say to me in that case, and I think people are starting to a kid up for the rest of his life with no chance of, of trying to rehabilitate him. Yeah, you know, that. I remember before I started as a prosecutor, uh, a friend of mine who's now deceased, but a very well-respected lawyer around here, uh, he said, you know, uh, just remember one thing, George, 
that uh, you know if you go prosecute a case and you and you don't win the case just remember that you know justice was done because the system worked and and he told me that before I ever became a prosecutor so when I went into the prosecutor's office I I took I, I took that as my that was my first thought was you know I'm just going to try this case and if I don't win the case well then justice was done uh, the second thing that uh, was of note is that I saw a uh, a prosecutor when I first started in the office who was in trouble with the Fourth Circuit over a discovery violation. He had uh, not disclosed some Brady material, and Brady material for those of you out there is it's material that you ha- you know prosecutors have to tell the defense you know stuff that might help their case. And he he left some Brady material in his file and didn't disclose it, and he ultimately was exonerated. But boy. Uh, that, that taught me something. You know what? When when I'm trying a case and I got a defense lawyer on the other side, here's my file. Here's what's in my file. I don't want to have my law license or my ethics or integrity called into question because I didn't provide you with this uh, material that you know the law says I have to give you. And uh, and I think that if prosecutors approach th- their job with both of those things in mind, then you're going to have a, a much better system. You know, I, I wish I had prosecuted. I had tried cases against you because it seems that you you really uh, respect the system and understand the system. And I think you're right that you can just Google Brady violations, and you will see prosecutor after prosecutor, U.S. attorney after U.S. attorney, not disclosing the information. And and you have to wonder at some point we're going to find it. Our investigator, somebody's going to find the information. So so what's the point of of failing to disclose it? It's just going to you know, make you look bad and unethical and hurt the case. And, you know, you might as well do your job uh, real quick. There's a story out of uh, uh, Northern California here recently where a it was a sexual assault rape case. It was a female victim who spoke only Spanish. The DA was, was having it, her interview transcribed and when the interview, when the transcription was done, the DA added a couple lines, which <laughs> were, question, you know, did you know, did did you do this, or you know, t- it was the the interview of the suspect. Did you do this? Answer: Yes, I did. And he handed over to the public defender with those additions to the transcript, uh, basically with the defendant admitting guilt. And uh, he's in a lot of trouble right now with his law license. Now he's saying it was just a joke, but, but I can't ever believe how something like that would just be a joke. So the defense attorney went to his client thinking that he'd made a confession and couldn't find out. He probably didn't speak Spanish, so he couldn't even find out himself. Right, right. <laughs> and they had to, you know, they had to listen to the tapes over and over and finally, you know, realize this guy never never admitted this. I, I remember when I was a prosecutor and I uh that th- we had a f- we had a flag that had a um a, w- that had a ball and chain on it. And the flag moved up and down the hallway, depending upon whether somebody had gotten a verdict, a good verdict or not. And, you know, I remember when the ball and fla- the ball and chain first arrived on my door. You know, it's like a pat on the back. You've just you've just locked somebody up. And it's a little bit like what you just said earlier, you know, them high fiving and, uh, you know, prosecutors high fiving and stuff. And, and I got to say, you know, I remember when the I, I mean, on the one hand, I was pleased that my colleagues had appreciated the good work I'd done and they were congratulating me on a verdict and so on. But at the same time, I thought, why should we be congratulating ourselves because we've locked somebody up? I mean, it's not really a a moment that we should be jumping up and down in, in glee and we've locked somebody up for a crime. And I think it's that sort of win at all costs, uh, uh, you know, mentality or certainly, gee, I'm going to get the glory if I win and I'm not going to get the flag if I lose might encourage a prosecutor maybe to bend the rules a little bit when they shouldn't. I think you're right. I think that's the natural effect. I mean, again, people commit a crime, there has to be a punishment. That's what happens to keep a stable society. But America, the United States, has more people incarcerated than, than, than most of the other countries in the world put together. Uh, so, you know, California started taking a different approach with rehabilitation, particularly for narcotics offenders. But I think you're right, uh, you know, if you reward and celebrate the win so much, you're you're almost indirectly or perhaps directly trying to create you know some some way for the prosecutors to get an advantage and say, well, I want this praise and accolade, so I'll do whatever I need to get this praise and accolade. 
What do you say to people when they ask you what you do? You're a criminal defense attorney. How, how do you, uh, I'm sure you get uh, people at cocktail parties or so on, or, you know, uh, your children's uh, social gatherings. They go, oh, criminal defense attorney, uh, uh, Gia, how, how do you defend somebody that's guilty, is, of course, is the first question they always ask. What do you say to people when they ask you what you do for a living and, uh, and about being a criminal defense attorney? Well, I've got to give you the answer with a quick anecdote. About 15 years ago when I was still single before I met my wonderful wife, I was at a bar with some friends talking to this beautiful woman, and she did at the end of the night ask me what I did for a living, and I did say I'm a criminal defense attorney. She looked at me and said, too bad because if you were a prosecutor, we'd be having sex right now, and she walked away. <laughs> and I kind, of, I kind of, that was my first introduction into the world about what it's like you know, to be a defense attorney. But I, I say it with pride now. Despite that incident, I say it with pride. I even consider myself a, constitution, a constitutional defense lawyer because that's what we really do when it comes down to it. Criminal defense attorneys protect the Constitution. You know, I'm sure your, your, your listeners have probably referenced or heard of the Fourth Amendment, you know, free from unreasonable searches and seizures. That's the bulk of my practice is, is looking at the, the stop and the police interaction and seeing if it was an unreasonable search or seizure. So with pride, I tell people, you know what I do? I defend people that are accused of kidnapping and crime. I protect their constitutional rights, and I make sure the criminal justice system works because we're one of the few countries that allows guarantees you the right to have counsel no matter how heinous the charge is and i wouldn't want it ever any other way and i could never imagine it any other way so i welcome the comments and i try to educate those that are making the disparaging comments by saying look the reason you sir as an african-american or you sir as a mexican-american are not pulled over for walking down the street or driving your car is because of people like me people like you and, and people like uh, all of the colleagues out there that, that, that practice criminal defense. Well, this is uh, the, the search and seizure. I'd like to, we're going to go to a break in just a minute, David. So I want you to come back and talk about that because so many people don't really understand what their constitutional rights are, do they? I mean, they'll, they'll come in and say, well, gee, I wasn't read my, I wasn't read my rights or, you know, gee, they didn't have the right to stop me or they didn't have the right to do this. And it, you, you've had a, a long career now in, and, and trying to defend these constitutional rights. When we come back from the break, I'd like to talk about search and seizure laws because in, uh, in my career, uh, you know, when, after I got out of law school, um, the, the, as you know, the course of the last 25, 30 years, the Supreme Court has slowly, inexorably, uh, gradually uh, made search and seizure law more and more favorable to the police as opposed to the defendant and individuals. I'm sure you're well aware of that. Uh, and so you've probably been been successful in many of these cases. And I'd like to come back and have you talk about how you prevail in a case of an unlawful or unreasonable search and seizure. We'll be right back here with Justice for All. Okay, we're back. This is George Yates. I'm the host of Justice for All. We're on 1650 AM on WHKT Radio. And we're here with super lawyer David Diamond. He's a go-to criminal defense attorney from Los Angeles, California. We've been talking with uh, David for the last 30 minutes or so about uh, his criminal defense uh, practice and specialty in Los Angeles. And uh, right before the break, we were talking about uh, his experience in defending um, the constitutional rights of his clients, uh, both search and seizure and uh, Fifth Amendment rights against uh, incrimination and so on. Let's talk about search and seizure a little bit. Uh, David, for those out there that don't understand what the Constitution says about that, what is the search and seizure and, and how does that apply? What are the constitutional rights that our, that our, our, our listeners have? Well, the, the, the bright and intelligent founders of this great country realized that there was a time when, when people would come into your homes and, uh, without justification or provocation, and they made uh, you know, 
some some starting theories about that, which evolved into amendments to the Constitution, and one of which is, as you mentioned, the Fourth Amendment, which is, you know, you as a citizen are free from an unreasonable search of your of your home, of your car, of your property, and free from an unreasonable seizure of your property, uh, absent, uh, you know, probable cause to do so. And what this basically means is that the cops have to have some some facts, some some evidence that gives them justification to come in and and invade your province, you know, your your, your castle. The the Supreme Court on many occasions said, you know, home is 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 the castle. There's no there's no more important place that that you should feel free from from someone coming in and, and kicking your doors. Or you know, basically, it's no different than than Nazi Germany, where where you didn't have any rights, and so. Slowly and surely, the Supreme Court has has bitten and chewed into this Fourth Amendment and made an exception after an exception after an exception. Fortunately, there still is some foundation left to it, but the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, you know, where you don't have to testify and incriminate yourself, uh, are, are slowly being eaten away. Even Miranda is, is slowly being 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 chewed apart. Well, the. Uh... The Fourth Amendment, does it apply to you if you're driving in your car? If you're driving in your car, it absolutely does. And oftentimes we make motions, uh, you know, to, to suppress, meaning to throw out evidence that police find. Uh, if you're simply a person of minority driving down the street, no traffic violations, uh, no, no uh, circumstances of, of criminal activity afoot, you cannot just be pulled over and questioned by law enforcement. Um, they, you know, they have to see an expired registration tag. They have to see, you know, a moving violation. There has to be your vehicle involved in the crime. There has to be again something that gives them this idea that you were involved in a crime. And and you know, uh, the most common thing you see if you were going Google or YouTube is officer pulls up to somebody and says, "Can I search your vehicle?" That's the one major way law enforcement gets around the Fourth Amendment protection is if you consent to the search, then you're basically foregoing your constitutional rights. So for all your listeners out there, no, no, no. No means no. Tell the officers they cannot search your car. And it doesn't matter whether you've got anything to hide or don't have anything to hide. If you're being asked to search your car, you're being asked to consent, you're saying no. It's just a matter of principle. It doesn't, it's just, that's just the way it is. And, and the officer is going to say to you, well, why are you saying no? What do you have to hide? And your answer is, I've got nothing to hide. I, I'm a supporter of the Constitution, and, and I believe, sir, you are as well. And uh, you can't just, you know, the same way you don't want me to come to your house and look through your stuff, you can't do that with my stuff. What is your, your feel on the, uh, the some of this? Uh, I've had some guests on my show that that are talking about what the NSA has been doing uh, uh, with reading emails and and we all know that our our privacy in our in our phone conversations and our emails have been monitored now by the NSA for many years uh and are being deposited somewhere in a in a big uh, uh building out in Utah somewhere um what is your thoughts on what are your thoughts on that the those fourth circuit violate those fourth uh, uh, amendment violations well to me it it's it's Upsetting. It's upsetting on a on a personal level for the love I have for this country and the things that it stands for, and it's upsetting to me on a professional level because we, you know, fight for these things every day. I know there's a balance because we are certainly living in a time and an era that was different than that with which our founding fathers lived in. Uh, we've got terrorist attack. We've got enemies that want to do things to us that are unimaginable, but. If you start giving away personal freedoms and securities, uh, you know, by the, based upon the fear that somebody else is coming after you, we're left with nothing, nothing left uh, at all. And I think that just waving the, the the badge, well, it's is, you know, we're national security. Uh, this is a terrorist uh, investigation. I, I think somewhat that's exaggerated, and I think that somewhat it's unnecessary, and and, and uh, you know. You want to go back to the old chance? Give me, you know, give me liberty or give me death. A lot of people say that that this is this is an erosion of of the rights that this country was you know, really founded upon. My understanding is that uh, um, you are um, also a professor at Southwestern um, University School of Law. 
That is correct. And you teach a trial advocacy program there, and I'm sure you mentor a lot of young lawyers. What is your, uh, uh, what is your, I would say, admonition to young lawyers? How do you, what's your first thing that you say to them in terms of how, how, in training them to become good trial lawyers? Well, I, I, the first thing I really say to students and, and, and is, is simple. Don't, don't do it like you see on TV, and don't do it like you think uh, it has to be this, this animation putting on the show. I said, you've got to really focus and hone in on your skill set, and sometimes you're going to lose, and I think that's the biggest lecture we give is that you're going to lose cases. Now, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily not as good as the other, you know, the other attorney on the side. I've lost trials before. I mean, obviously, no lawyers undefeated. I've lost trials, that, trials to DAs that are much more skilled than I. I've lost trials to DAs that are no, nowhere near as skilled as I am. And so I give them this. The title of the lecture is, is really called The Facts are the Facts. And sometimes the facts of a case are the facts of a case. Gang members shoot somebody, 100 eyewitnesses caught on video camera. There's not a whole lot you can do with that, and sometimes the facts are just the facts. But in terms of getting past that, in terms of what we really teach about litigation skills, we teach them to be thorough. We teach them to prepare. We teach them to leave no stone unturned, to, to really read and reread and prepare and, and re-prepare for the cases, and we take it through a very slow process of jury selection and opening statements, and direct examination, and cross-examination, and closing arguments, and requesting particular jury instructions, and then uh, arguing you know, for, for dismissals, and, and arguing for non-suits, and everything that, that accompanies that. And then we, we do something that I think is really fun for a student, is we send them off to a mock trial competition, and they represent the law school, and they go out and compete against 20 other law schools, and they get the fictitious uh, criminal problem, and they get to actually see their skill sets. And I think they have a really good time seeing, you know, they don't have to wait till they graduate to be in a, in a courtroom setting. And they get to really practice and see what it's like to, to litigate a real case. Your, uh, your practice is criminal defense. Uh, you, I believe about 90% of it is criminal defense. Um, That's correct. Tell what does that consist of? What is criminal defense? What's the bulk of it? Oh, the bulk of it is really anyone that's accused of a crime, whether it's a misdemeanor or a felony. So we do everything from the lowest end, which is disturbing the peace, drunk in public, to the toughest cases out there, murder, solicitation of murder, things of that nature. I can't tell you how many cases I've had where I've represented a spouse that was accused of, of unfortunately plotting to kill their spouse in another case. Those are those are really the, the interesting cases, those types of uh, solicitations of murder. Once I had a, a wife who solicited whom she thought was a hitman to kill her husband, and this guy was actually an undercover cop that had got wind of her, her, her story, so she was actually soliciting the, the, the killing of her husband to, to a sworn peace officer at the time, and as you can imagine, that certainly made for, for a great trial. And you defended it? And I defended it. Did you, uh, and what was the result of that case? Well, the jury gave us the jury gave us a bone on, uh, threw us a bone on that case. They acquitted her on the attempted murder case, uh, attempt murder charge, but they convicted her on the solicitation of murder aspect of it. So I think they they split it both ways. In California, for attempt murder, you've got to make some kind of overt act that that is in furtherance of the crime. And she had really she had done everything possible uh, up until you know doing something herself. Fortunately, the husband was not killed was not injured, and, 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 and I think justice kind of worked out for everybody involved. As you said, that you're one of your, you know, uh, one of your advisors had told you justice works. Uh, justice in the system worked itself out. And you've had more than one of those? Solicitation yeah, to I've, kill a spouse? Believe it or not, I've probably had a handful of those, uh, <laughs> which <laughs> leads you... me to worry about, you know, marriage these days, certainly, but uh, it's, th- those cases are always interesting and, and emotionally you know, charge when you've got spouses accusing one another of things. And once you'd done one, I guess you became the go-to guy, huh? It... I, I unfortunately must have been become the go-to guy. Maybe that my my name is written on the wall of marriage therapy somewhere. I, I don't know, but I, I certainly did get a lot of those calls coming in. Well, don't they just call that Los Angeles divorce? <laughs> We've got a lot of those, you know, and that's a whole other topic for another day about the <laughs> the, the negative aspect Sorry. of advertising that, that we've gotten in, in, in the world of lawyers. 
Yeah, because uh, I, I think that when you have one of these uh, marital murder type cases, I think there's always a tendency on the part of the jury to uh, uh, break it down. Uh, to uh, either When there's actually a killing, sometimes it can never quite become first degree because I think they realize that the emotion involved in a marriage uh, seems to always knock down the degree to second degree or down in our state would be manslaughter. Uh, you know, there's... Maybe it's just the nature of the marital relationship um, it makes it those is. cases a little different than soliciting to kill, let's say, somebody else, you know, for money or something like that. And, and a lot of times, I think there's some cases on the East Coast where I saw where uh, there was a mistress, uh, you know, a mistress is solicited by the man to kill the wife, and the ghost of case, and then you see the wife sitting there supporting the man, thinking, well, he would have never tried to kill me. It was it must have been the mistress idea, and so you get even crazier outcomes when you, when you when you see the victim of a purported hit supporting the person that tried to kill her. Well, that was like Joey Budafuco, wasn't that? That was that famous yeah. case in New Jersey, I think you might be talking yep. about. So, um, when you, uh, um, you also do a lot of DUI work, I guess. Uh, we do do a DUI. Unfortunately, in Los Angeles County, the highest amount of arrests for a criminal case are DUI arrests. We have more DUI arrests than any other uh, crime in, 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 uh, in the penal code. And what does a DUI uh, defense consist of in Los Angeles? I know it's quite a bit different than it is here in Virginia. It's very technical. I, I, you know, one of the things that, that I've always said, and I think you and I spoke about, is I consider DUI, DUI work to be the most detail and technical work, at least in California, uh, that there is, because there's so much science and medical evidence behind it, and that's why you get a lot of good criminal defense attorneys that uh, sit through, and I've been there, and I do it every year, some of the most boring uh, continuing education lectures there are where they bring in physicists and kinesiologists and, and, and medical doctors, and it really to teach you about, you know, how the blood goes into the system, what we call absorption and how it goes out and called burn-off. And, you know, a lot of times the important thing to remember is what was your blood alcohol concentration at the time you were actually operating the motor vehicle as opposed to blowing into the machine or having your blood taken? Because, you know, it, it's, like, it's like a chart. It's like an inelastic uh, chart that you see where it goes up and it peaks and then it starts to burn off. So it's really a science and we present the science to the jurors to say, yeah, of course. Yeah, they blew a .13, and uh, we're a .08 state. But, you know, when they were driving the car, based on their sleep pattern, based on the food they consumed the night before, based on their physical body weight and height, they were really an 07 when they were driving the car, not not this 13 that you see on the device. And, and that's how we submit it to the jury. And the other way we attack it is the machines. Like any machine that's out there, I mean, how many times have you been on your computer and it's frozen up or done something you don't like? Same thing with these breath machines. They're just as unreliable. And then same thing with the blood, you know, blood cases. We, we recently won a blood case because the nurse, when she sterilized the person's arm to draw the blood, used a, a, an agent to sterilize that had a small amount of alcohol in there. And, we, uh, you know, our argument was, well... When the needle went into the skin, it was touching the sterilizing agent, and that's where the alcohol came from, not from, you know, the drinking. Well, you know, and that's we've done a, I've done a, a thousand DUI cases in the last twenty years, and uh, there, the, here in Virginia, we've got these uh, these machines, and they're gospel. You know, it's very hard to uh, to get around them, uh, and the problem with it, of course, is that you then have to hire, as you say, the toxicologists and the other. Okay, the kinesiologists and the other experts to come in. And so often people don't want to spend the money that's necessary to go in and defend uh, the charge that way. Uh, you're, you're trying these cases in front of jurors, though, and uh, you probably have a better chance trying the case in front of a juror than you would in front of a judge, correct? I, I believe so. I mean, you and I have spoken a little bit uh, in the past as well about this process. And, you know, there there's... There are some great, terrific judges in Los Angeles County, and there are also some people whom I consider to be DAs, basically with a black robe on. And so I, I would never want to put the fate of my client into the hands of somebody that doesn't know if they're still a little bit of a DA or still a little bit of a judge or somewhere in between. So when you get 12 people together in California and like Florida, fortunately, we get 12. 
when you get 12 people together, you need all 12 to say he's guilty. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's a fair system. It, it's set up that way, and I think that it's, it's easier to get some independent thinking, saying, you know what, I just, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't believe this machine is, functions as well as everybody tells me, or I don't think the police officer was doing his job or was, you know, telling what, the truth, and it what, helps out. What breath machine are, are is typically used there in your county? Uh, we have we have the Data Master and we have the, the the Intox machine, and those are the two that we use. Um, now we also have something. I don't know if they have it at the same thing in Virginia, but we have what's called the PASS, the Preliminary Alcohol Screening Device, which is a very portable handheld that the officer use when they first stop you and they have you blow into it. Now that right. one you actually have the right to refuse, and you don't have to take it. But that one under Dobbert and Fry and some other cases. That one has been held by the court to be unreliable as an evidentiary machine. So it can give the officer the probable cause to arrest you, take you to the station, and make you blow into the real machine. Uh, but the past device is still unreliable to the point of using it solely for a conviction. You're right. We, we call that the, the preliminary breath test. You can refuse it, and it can't be admitted against you in evidence in our state. Right. Same same kind of thing out here. So that and the field sobriety tests are the only things you can you can actually refuse to take. Now, um, what do you do with a client that you're defending and they've refused the breath machine, but the uh, they've failed the field sobriety tests? How do you go challenge those kinds of cases? Well, I, you know, it's funny when you say failing the field sobriety test because you know who, these guys are police officers that did one weekend seminar about administering a field sobriety test. What I've been fighting for, and a lot of other lawyers have you know, approached different state legislatures, we need to standardize these field sobriety tests. And even, they're called, even though they're called standardized field sobriety, they're not. They need to be a mathematical formula. For example, the walk and turn test, nine steps forward, turning, nine steps back, you actually can score that and say, well, he got 16 of the 18 right. That's a passing grade. The other stuff... Uh, horizontal gaze and stagmus and internal clock and things at Romberg, those are up to the cop's discretion. And I actually went through some post-certified uh, training undercover. I was just a normal Joe Schmo in the class. There were other peace officers there. We did what was called a wet lab where they brought in three or four different people who had been drinking various amounts in a controlled environment. And the officers had to give them a field sobriety test and then guess what their level was. You know, some people were a point oh oh hadn't even drank. Some people were a one a point one oh were over the limit. It's funny. Myself and the other uh, criminal defense attorney, we were there together taking the class. We actually were the only ones that accurately, you know, within a fair amount of range, guessed the correct blood alcohol level. These the peace officers, funny enough, were all saying, "Well, they they're drunk. They're all drunk. They're you know they're they're way out of there." And they weren't even remotely correct. Uh, and I'm not saying that's the true for every peace officer, but I'm saying for field sobriety tests, if you go in thinking someone's intoxicated, you're going to fail them on the field sobriety test. So, you, you know, you've got that predisposition to fail somebody. Well, now, in our state, we use the horizontal gaze and astagmus. We use that walk and turn, and we use the one-leg stand. And I agree with you. I use the term fail, uh, but it's, it's kind of like in college. You know, you could get an A, you could get an F, you could get a B+. Plus. Or for, lo- or for those folks who didn't go to go to college, ninth grade, <laughs> uh, right, you can get an A thing, or a B. But thing. but the way the police grade the uh, field sobriety test, if you don't get an A plus, then it's a fail. Uh, you know, so uh, so it, it and you, you but you say they're not standardized. So if you're going to do the walk and turn, uh, you do the nine steps up and the nine steps back, and you've got to do you know uh, hands at your side and. Uh, you know, aren't, aren't those standardized by the National Highway Transportation uh, Board? Well, I guess I should say I, I, you're right. I should clarify they're standardized by the, the by the actual things you have to do, but I don't think they're standardized in terms of the way you're scored on them. I think the sta- the scoring is still subjective as opposed to standardized. And what we need to do is create a standardized scoring system rather than the officer subjectivity. And you're right. absolutely correct. The, the administration of the test are absolutely standardized, although I've seen a lot of state troopers fail to do it, the, you know, to, to give them the, the, the proper way. So how do your experts uh, manage to do this? Uh, if you've got a uh, someone that stops you on a DUI 
and uh, and then you you maybe don't get down to the station for another hour, an hour and a half, and you blow a you know a point one zero or a one one, and you want to try to get the expert to um, to run it back so that at the time of the stop they were below the legal limit. Um, how do they how do they do that? They do that by the the age and the the metabolic rate of the person, and I guess there's a lot involved, isn't there? There's a lot involved. I mean, you know, going back to the old days when we could probably keep up with those younger than us, you know, you've got lightweights and heavyweights, to put it as unsophisticated as, as possible. And a lot of that is, is, you know, metabolic rate. Weight is a big factor, an enormous factor, you know, people's weight in these cases. So uh, they, they account for this. They put the science together. They make these wonderful, you know, demonstrative charts for me. And then I, I just explained to the jury, you know, through their testimony about, okay, this is really what the, you know, what the reading was at the time of, of operation of the vehicle. We've got a, California, we've got to uh, get blood within three hours. Uh, you know, if you've had your blood drawn two and a half hours after the incident, there's a lot you can, you can talk about with in terms of what the reading actually was. Well, doesn't the blood alcohol level drop, though, instead of rise? Well, it does two things, and that's why that's why we use this pass device we were talking about. Uh, because if you get the pass reading, and then you get the evidentiary reading, you're going to be going one way or other on the bell curve. You know, the old-fashioned bell curve that we all unfortunately learned about back in high school. You're either going to get a rising or a dropping, and obviously we want a rising defense because you know, oh, they were .06 at driving, they were .08 at the pass, and they were .10 on the breath. If the numbers work the other way for us and it's a dropping, then we're hurt because at the time of operation they're going to be significantly higher than they than they were when the when the test came out. So it goes either way. You're hoping for a rising, you know, set of data that shows rising. Uh, most of the time, you you get either a flat line or or a dropping kind of case, and then you can't use the rising defense. Well, and do you do you get jurors sometimes that you think just uh, decide they want to let that person go, even though they might have been under the influence? I, I think you you know I I've had some cases, and I you know I stopped talking to jurors about five years ago because, really, quite honestly, I I don't understand anything anymore about the thought process. <laughs> but when I did when I did talk to them after trials, a lot of them would say, "Look, you know, I I, I drink a twelve pack every night, and I'm fine." So this person was definitely fine. You know, you, you get some people that throw their personal life experience in, into their decision-making process. Unbelievable. Yeah, we, uh, we have jury sentencing here in Virginia. So if you ask for a jury trial, uh, then the jury, if they find you not guilty, um, then great, you, you walk out. But if they find you guilty, then they can sentence you to, of course, to uh, no time at all, no jail time and just a fine. Or they can give you you know, up to 12 months. So a lot of people just don't want to take a chance that they're going to ask for a jury uh, because, okay, they might have a better chance of getting acquitted, but then a jury might give them 10 days or 30 days or 60 days where if they just plead guilty to the charge in front of a judge on a first offense, ordinarily they're not going to do any active time depending upon how low their blood alcohol content. We do have some mandatory uh, um, do you have, do you have mandatory time for certain kinds of le- level of uh, blood alcohol content? No mandatory time for the level, uh, but on a second time offense, it's mandatory ninety six hours in custody. So it's based on the amount of DUIs you get, but not this super DUI as they call it in a lot of states. And is uh, is it ever a felony uh, DUI? You, do you have a recidivist where if you hit a, a three or four strikes, you're out? Uh, felony DUI. After your third DUI, if you pick up a fourth, it becomes a felony within the 10-year period. And also, if you cause somebody injury, great bodily injury in the commission, it becomes a felony DUI as well. Yeah, because um, I'm fascinated by the fact that uh, our jury trial, our, our trials here on felonies just do not take that, or on, on, missed, uh, on DUIs just do not take that long. And on uh, and in California, you're saying uh, you, can, you can take a week on a DUI trial or more? Uh, I've never had a trial that lasts less than a week on any case that I've ever done. And, and uh, you know, part of that could be just how backed up our court system is, and we don't have full days necessarily. Sometimes we don't start till 10 or 11 every morning because the court is doing other matters in the morning, so sometimes that's a factor to it. Uh, but 
for the most part, the judges will give you discretion on, on voir dire, on jury selection, which will make it take a little bit longer. Uh, but, yeah, it was interesting when you were telling me about both the expediency with which some trials out there t- took place and also the sentencing done by, by the jurors, which is just a whole, you know, as you were saying, whole different ball game. Yeah, Virginia is one of just uh, three, maybe four states, I think, that actually has jury sentencing, and it does chill your, uh, your, your incentive to want to take a case to a jury. Well, but as a practical matter, David, how in the world is somebody, your person that's, you know, working in a, you know, they're a waiter at a restaurant or something like that, and they get a DUI. How in the world can they pay a lawyer of your caliber uh, the amount of money that it takes to spend five days in, in trial on a DUI? That's uh, Isn't that beyond the, the financial ability of most uh, DUI defendants? It, it really is. I mean, obviously, you can request the use of a public defender. I think in California, the threshold is pretty pretty low. I think you have to be making under, I want to say it's under twenty four or $25,000 a year to get the services of the public defender. Uh, but you can always find a lawyer that's inexpensive and it's unfortunate. You know, I see billboards all the time out here, DUI defense, $599 flat fee. Uh, unfortunately, in those situations, you probably get what you're paying for. Um, but you're right, that's another inequity about the justice system that you and I talked about You know, earlier in the conversation was uh, if you can't afford an attorney, uh, you're, you know, you, you, you might just not have somebody that can give you the time to do everything that's required. So when that jury, uh, when that lawyer quotes the fee, the 599 fee to the client, and then the client says, well, I want to go to a trial, does that mean that that, that lawyer is going to be charging, you know, $600 to just spend a week in trial? I mean, what? I, I can't imagine it includes trial. I've never really followed up with those guys you see on the billboards, but... Most of the time, most uh, lawyers out here in California, there's two fee structures. It's, it's the fee from the arraignment up until the eve of trial, and then the trial fees. So my, my hunch is that is everything with the exception of, of going to trial. Well, and, and my other sense is the lawyer that's advertising on the billboard has never taken the UI trial, case to trial and, and would be ill-prepared to do so. Well, uh, it sounds to me like uh, this has been a great hour. We're going to have to wrap up this first hour here with David Diamond. I have one question before the end of the show, uh, David. Um, when, when you when you care about your clients as much as you do, uh, and it's it's obvious from the, your passion to your your job, how do you compartmentalize your life? How do you uh, how do you represent people that are faced with such serious uh, consequences and still, you know, go home to your family and enjoy your life without uh, constantly worrying about your job? And, and how, how do you how do you reconcile your your passion for defending people and still going home and, and having a real life? Well, the, the emotional burden is overwhelming, and there are times when it's very difficult for me to to cope with everything I, I'm going on. I, I don't have a problem with my clientele. In fact, I've asked in gatherings that uh, gang members, for example, are often the most respectful clients I've ever had that often recognize the work we're doing, and, and I never feel endangered uh, representing that element of society. Uh, it's usually the wealthy people that are saying, you know, here's money, just make the case go away, make this DUI go away, that, that have expectations. But in terms of the burden, I think you'll see that's why there's so much abuse of alcohol and drugs and even suicide in the criminal defense bar. And it's unfortunate out here because it does take a significant toll when you have to go to bed at night thinking, am I going to be able to get this kid out of custody? And, and the worst part is when we have truly innocent people, because then you know if you screw up, then you've really screwed up because you've got someone locked away for something they did not do. And that is when I lose sleep at nights. Well, it's been a very uh, interesting last hour. David, I'd like to thank you for uh, joining us for this uh, this last hour. We're going to be right back after these messages, and we'll go with the second hour of David Diamond, super lawyer from Los Angeles, California. And uh, this is 1650 AM. I'm George Yates. I'm the host, and this is your show, uh, Justice for All. <laughs> 